before the fellowship was the greatest story you've never heard. I'm Dan. I'm Greg. I'm Cameron. Join us as we read and react to The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. Last time, we concluded Chapter 19. Beren and Luthien returned to Metagroth, and Beren revealed that he did not have a Silmaril. Karkaroth was still a threat in Doriath, so Beren and Thingol set out to slay him. Beren was gravely wounded while trying to protect Thingol. Juan battled against Karkaroth and eventually defeated him, but he was mortally wounded in the process. He spoke for the final time and bade farewell to Beren before dying. Thingol's guards cut open Karkaroth and found Beren's hand holding the Silmaril. Beren considered his quest complete. He was taken back to Menegroth, where he died before Luthien. Luthien's spirit went to the halls of Mandos, and she sang before him. Mandos was moved to pity. Manwe gave Luthien two options, to remain in Valmar and be healed of all her hurts, or to take on mortality and return with Beren to Middle-earth. She chose the latter, and her choice joined the two kindreds. Today we begin chapter 20, beginning on page 188 of the second edition. It is said that Beren and Luthien returned to the northern lands of Middle-earth and dwelt together for a time as living man and woman, and they took up again their mortal form in Doriath. Those that saw them were both glad and fearful, and Luthien went to Menegroth and healed the winter of Thingol with the touch of her hand. But Melian looked in her eyes and read the doom that was written there and turned away, for she knew that a parting beyond the end of the world had come between them, and no grief of loss has been heavier than the grief of Melian, the Maya, in that hour. Then Beren and Luthien went forth alone, fearing neither thirst nor hunger, and they passed beyond the river Galeon into Osirian, and dwelt there in Tol Galan, the Green Isle, in the midst of Adorant, until all tidings of them ceased. The Eldar afterwards called that country Dor Fern i Guina, the land of the dead that live. And there was born Dior Aranel, the beautiful, who was after known as Dior Luchil, which is Thingol's heir. No mortal man spoke ever again with Beren, son of Barahir, and none saw Beren or Luthien leave the world, or marked where at last their bodies lay. In those days, Mithros, son of Fëanor, lifted up his heart, perceiving that Morgoth was not unassailable, for the deeds of Beren and Luthien were sung in many songs throughout Beleriand. Yet Morgoth would destroy them all, one by one, if he could not again unite and make a new league and common council. And he began those councils for the raising of the fortunes of the Eldar that are called the Union of Mithros. Yet the oath of Feanor and the evil deeds that it wrought did injury to the design of Mithros, and he had less aid than should have been. Orodreth would not march forth at the word of any son of Feanor because of the deeds of Kelegorm and Curafin, and the elves of Nargothrond trusted still to defend their hidden stronghold by secrecy and stealth. Thence came only a small company, following Gwyndor, son of Gwilin, a very valiant prince, and against the will of Orodreth, he went to the northern war, because he grieved for the loss of Gelmir, his brother, in the Dagor Bragolach. They took the badge of the house of Fingolfin and marched beneath the banners of Fingon, and they never came back save one. From Doriath came little help, for Mithros and his brothers, being constrained by their oath, 
had been before sent to Thingol and reminded him with haughty words of their claim, summoning him to yield the Silmaril or become their enemy. Melian counseled him to surrender it, but the words of the sons of Feanor were proud and threatening, and Thingol was filled with anger, thinking of the ambush, anguish of Luthien, and the blood of Beren, whereby the jewel had been won, despite the malice of Kelegorm and Curufin. And every day that he looked upon the Silmaril, the more he desired to keep it forever, for such was its power. Therefore he sent back the messengers with scornful words. Mithras made no answer, for he had now begun to devise the league and union of the elves, but Kelegorm and Curufin vowed openly to slay Thingol and destroy his people. If they came victorious from war and the jewel were not surrendered of free will. Then Thingol fortified the marches of his realm and went not to war, nor any out of Doriath save Magblung and Beleg, who were unwilling to have no part in these great deeds. To them, Thingol gave leave to go, so long as they served not the sons of Feanor and they joined themselves to the host of Fingon. But Mithros had the help of the Norgrim, both in armed force and in great store of weapons. And the smithies of Nogrond and Belagost were busy in those days, and he gathered together again all his brothers and all the people who would follow them. And the men of Bor and Ulfgang were marshaled and trained for war, and they summoned yet more of their kinsfolk out of the east. Moreover, in the west of Fingon, ever the friend of Mithros took counsel with him, Himring, and in Hithlum, the Noldor and the men of the house of Hado prepared for war. In the forest of Brethil Hamir, lord of the people of the Haleth, gathered his men, and they wetted their axes. But Halmir died ere the war came, and Haldir, his son, ruled that people. And to Gondolin also tidings came, to Turgon, the hidden king. But Mithros made trial of his strength too soon, ere his plans were full wrought. And though the orcs were driven out of all the northward regions of Beleriand, and even Dorthonian was freed for a while, Morgoth was warned of the uprising of the Aldar and the elf friends and took counsel against them. Many spies and workers of treason he sent forth among them, as he was the better able now to do, for the faithless men of his secret allegiance were yet deep in the secrets of the sons of Feanor. At length, Mithros, having gathered all the strength that he could of the elves and men and dwarves, resolved to assault Angband from the east and west, and he purposed to march with banners displayed in open force over Anfogleth. But when he had drawn forth, as he hoped, the armies of Morgoth in answer, then Fingon should issue forth from the passes of Hithlum, and thus they thought to take the might of Morgoth as between anvil and hammer and break it to pieces. And the signal for this was to be the firing of a great beacon in Dorthonian. On the appointed day, on the morning of midsummer, the trumpets of the Eldar greeted the rising of the sun, and in the east raised the standard of the sons of Fëanor, and in the west the standard of Fingon, high king of the Noldor. Then Fingon looked out from the walls of Ethel Sirion, and his host was arrayed in the valleys and the woods upon the east of Erid Wethrin well hid from the eyes of the enemy. But he knew that it was very great, for there are all the Noldor of Hithlum were assembled, together with elves of the Phalas and Gwyndor's company from Nargothrond, and he had great strength of men. Upon the right were the host of Dor Lomin, and all the valor of Hurin and Huor, his brother, and to them had come Halde of Brethril, and many men of the woods. 
Then Fingon looked towards Thangodurim, and there was a dark cloud about it, and a black smoke went up, and he knew that the wrath of Morgoth was roused, and their challenge was accepted. A shadow of doubt fell upon Fingon's heart, and he looked eastwards, seeking if he might see with elven sight the dust of Angfogleth rising beneath the hosts of Mithros. He knew not that Mithros had hindered in his setting forth by the guile of Aldor the accursed, who deceived him with false warnings of assault from Angband. But now a cry went up, passing up the wind from the south and from vale to vale, and elves and men lifted their voices in wonder and joy. For unsummoned and unlooked for, Turgon had opened the Liga of Gondolin and was come with an army 10,000 strong, with bright mail and long swords and spears like a forest. Then when Fingon heard afar the great trumpet of Turgon his brother, the shadow passed, and his heart was uplifted, and he shouted aloud, Utelian ore, aye adele, ar atana tari, Utelian ore. The day has come. Behold, people of the Eldar and fathers of men, the day has come. And all those who heard his great voice echo in the hills answered, crying, Uta ilome. The night is passing. Now Morgoth, who knew much of what was done and designed by his enemies, chose his hour and trusting in his treacherous servants to hold back Mithros and prevent the union of his foes, he sent a force seeming great and yet but part of all that he had made ready towards Hithlam, and they were clad all in dun raiment, and showed no naked steel, and thus were already far over the sands of Angothlith before their approach was seen. Then the hearts of the Noldor grew hot, and their captains wished to assail their foes upon the plain, but Hurin spoke against it, and bade them beware of the guile of Morgoth, whose strength was always greater than it seemed, and his purpose other than he revealed. And Though the signal of the approach of Mithros came not, and the host grew impatient, Hurin urged them to await it, and to let the orcs break themselves in assault upon the hills. But the captain of Morgoth, in the west, had been commanded to draw out Fingon swiftly from the hills by whatever means he could. He marched on, therefore, until the front of his battle was drawn up before the stream of Sirion from the walls of the fortress of the Aethil Sirion to the inflowing of Rivil at the Fen of Serech. And the outposts of Fingon could see the eyes of their enemies. But there was no answer to his challenge. And the taunts of the orcs faltered as they looked upon the silent walls and the hidden threat of the hills. Then the captain of Morgoth sent out riders with tokens of parley, and they rode up before the outworks of the Barad Aethel. With them they brought Gelmir, son of Gwilin, that lord of Nargothrond, whom they had captured in the Bragokala, and they had binded him, blinded him. Then the heralds of Angban show him forth, crying, We have many more such at home, but you must make haste if you will find them, for we shall deal with them all when we return, even so. And they hewed off Gelmir's hands and feet, and his head last within the sight of the elves, and left him. In summary, Beren and Luthien return to Doriath. Is, am I in the right place? <laughs> Luthien heals the winter of Thingol. Melian cannot bear to look upon Luthien, knowing that it is now their fate to be separated by death. Beren and Luthien travel into Osiriant and bear a son, Dior Arenel, the heir of, to Thingol. Mithros attempts to rally the Eldar against Morgoth, 
but mistrust keeps them divided. The sons of Feanor demand Thingol return the Silmaril that is rightfully theirs, but he refuses. Mithros gathers willing soldiers from Menegroth and from among men and dwarves. On the day of their assault, Mithros' plans are frustrated by the betrayal of a man called Uldor. Fingon begins to despair, and Turgon and his army arrive from Gondolin. Morgoth uses his cunning and deci- deceit to keep the various armies of the Eldar separated. His captain approaches Fingon and brings a prisoner from Ungband. He decapitates the prisoner and threatens to kill more prisoners in an attempt to draw Fingon's forces to Ungband. Okay. Camarindor. What is your... What's your thoughts of this? Well, my my first thought was that Baron and Luthien chose a life that wasn't surely going to be free of sorrow and woe. And, you know, right after they bear a son, um, battles ensue. (laughs) So they, they come into the into the breach that stuck out to me I like this uh, note <clears throat> the country that that they went to they call the land of the dead that live and it isn't you know reading this this little passage at the beginning where it kind of concludes the story of Baron and Luthien it makes me think Luthien had been around for ages you know um she was born i think before the the sun and the moon were set in the sky um so she's kind of like this fixture in doriath like just this this wellspring of like youth and beauty and goodness and like we've seen with all the other men in the story they just pass so quickly like thingol and turgon have lived for ages and ages and men have to go to, like we just read about it right now. Even Halmir dies before they're prepared for battle. It's like the, the, the spans of time that they're working with are so different. And so Luthien, who is kind of this fixture of beauty in the world is just like suddenly gone after choosing mortality and just kind of, is like blinks out of existence, like in the world. She's, they don't even know where Baron and Luthien's bodies lay. But it's a great transition of the story that they, their story gives hope to people that Morgoth, there's like, um, there's a chink in his, in his armor mm. that, that he is, we, we, we can, we can like attack. We can, we can right. Get... Right. Oh, that's such a good point. I wasn't thinking of that exactly, but yeah, the fact that Baron, a simple man could, you know, break into Ong bond itself, the, the hells of iron and take a successfully take a Silmaril <laughs> from the crown of Morgoth. Like when you put it in that perspective, it's this massive yeah. deed that was done that shows that he can be defeated and yeah can you imagine the stories he was able to tell like what happened to your arm where's where's oh, your I, hand i imagine he like didn't say anything you know it was he had like severe ptsd and he was just like don't ask me about <laughs> interesting <that stuff." laughs> interesting i think it, it just grew in legend yeah um and he probably wouldn't boast about it but when asked about it he's used an opportunity to talk about his love for luthien Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the lengths he is willing to go for her. Yes, that's that's true. Yeah. No, I wasn't. I wasn't taking notes, but I mean, that's said pretty much. Yeah, you're right. Recently, right. um, Morgoth was not unassailable for the deeds of Baron and it. Luthien were yeah. sung in many songs. Yeah, a great great transition in the story. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So one thing that stood out to me from this reading was I, I always am talking about the Oath of Feanor, but that's kind of what prevents them from having more success in this assault. They're divided, They're divided. There's this mistrust. But I do love, I mean, we, if we go way back, we can see um, 
that uh, the people of Fingon do respond to the call to go to battle because Fingon and Maedras are buds. They're like besties. Right, like yeah. Men. Did Maedras save Fingon or the other way around? It was the other way. Fingon, the valiant, the son of Fingolfin, um, went into the north and, and saved uh, Maedras playing his harp. So it's because my so it's cool. funny because in my mind, and I don't know if this is exactly true, but Maidros is like one of the more honorable sons of Feanor. Yeah. Like he he they all were, t- were pretty terrible in yeah. burning the ships and like abandoning Fingolfin's people. But Maidros, there was like that t- sort of healing that <clears throat> happened when Fingon went to rescue him. And he seems to me to be the more honorable one, but it's really like Kelagorm and Kurofin who have kind of poisoned the waters between all the peoples. They're just the worst. They're the absolute worst. And is, it, and is Maedros the one who's trying to get the armies together to fight Morgoth? Yes. Yeah, so that does seem honorable. He's like seeking unity because he, he was saved right, um, by a son of Fingolfin. And so the the house he wants the houses to come together and fight. So that there uh, is something very honorable in that. Yes, but he's still under the same kind of uh, lure of the Silmaril that Fanor sure. was. Yeah. Like it says, sure. and every day he looked upon the Silmaril. The more he desired to keep it forever. Well, that's for talking about Thingol. That's talking about Thingol. Thingol oh. refuses to because. In a sense, oh, yeah. my, Sorry. my yeah, right. still yeah. does believe that the Sumeril rightfully belongs to him and his brothers. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Sorry. And he does he is part of the you know the sons of Feanor who demand that Thingol give up the Silmaril that he has. But I did I did underline that um that line where it says that every day that Thingol looked upon the Silmaril, the more he desired to keep it forever. For such was its power. And it made me wonder about uh have we talked about like soft magic versus hard magic in this show before? Maybe. I don't, I'm not like an expert in fantasy and fiction, but I know uh, my friend Jake who, who writes some fantasy. Um, he's a big fan of Brandon Sanderson. Have you guys read any of those books? Any of his books? No. Um, no. Our, our, our friend Matthew, he's a big fan of uh, this series to Mistborn. Oh yeah. I heard of this. Yeah. So that one's more like it's it's a like what's called like a hard magic system. Like there's rules to how it works, and they burn metals that have effects. They you burn a certain metal and it gives you strength, or you burn a different metal and it allows you to levitate or something. So um, there's like very fixed rules. There's like systematic you know elements to it. Whereas like the magic in in this is very vague. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you, you don't necessarily know what Gandalf can or can't do until he does something, right? And it's interesting because maybe that is part of the appeal of the Silmarils. Like, there's kind of a magic in them, this soft magic that has its effect. Like, it burns the hand of Morgoth, but it allows. It's kind of alive, and it's a, they're alive in their own way too. They it says that they suffer to allow, or they suffer um, to be carried by Baron without harming him. Um, I didn't say that right, but it says something like that, right? And that they they, they kind of allow themselves mm. to be carried by Baron yeah, without right. harming him. So there's this kind of like, we've gone back and forth about the Silmarill so many times. So maybe maybe we've, we're, we're beating a dead horse with this, but no, there's no, something it, there that it's like, there's this kind of magic within it. Discovering it. Because <clears throat> power... And it's not like a power to be wielded, but it's a. Um, it it made me wonder, like maybe that's how all these magic rings are and things. You know, they. Like okay, I, um, I don't have my copy of the Lord of the Rings with me right now, but, um, when Kirdan gives the Red Ring of Fire, 
Oh, it is here. This is I'm skipping way, way ahead. But listen to this really quick. This is on page 304, where it's talking about the events of the Third Age, the Rings of Power, and everything. And it says, uh, Cirdan, uh, the Red Ring of Fire had been entrusted to Cirdan, Lord of the Havens, but he had surrendered it to Mithrandir, who is Gandalf, for he knew whence he came and whither at last he would return. Take now this ring, he said, for thy labors and thy cares will be heavy, but in all it will support thee and defend thee from weariness. For this is the ring of fire, and herewith, maybe, thou shalt rekindle hearts to the valor of old in a world that grows chill. So he's kind of describing like the power of this particular ring. And um, its power is to rekindle hearts to the valor of old. Its power isn't necessarily to like shoot fire out of your fingers. Right. You know, it's oh, like, or it's this... um, maybe the, another way to say the difference between hard and soft magic is hard magic is incantations that lead you to control something. Whereas soft magic is, is, is more subtle. Um, it's not about a, um, it's not even necessarily about like an external act. It's like this transformation or this mm. it, like empowering this internal empowering. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that the the ring of fire would lead to zeal, you know, grow, glowing in the hearts of people for the, the, the old age, the age that was. You know, I think after Gandalf, Johnny Cash possessed the ring of fire. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should start off uh, like a, a tree, <clears throat> a family tree. All the way down. <laughs> I know. I mean, again, it's 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 it has Mithrandir a similar. Mithrandir to Johnny. <laughs> quality. <laughs> Love is a burning thing, <laughs> and it makes a ring of power. <laughs> I destroyed a ring of power. I went down, down, down. <laughs> <laughs> um i was just gonna say that that line just again it just reminds me of the connection of the effects of the silmarils with the effects of the the one ring of power how dare you bring that up again i know i'm just <laughs> i'm you call call it proof texting but i think that <laughs> um, the connections are there it's it's it seems pretty clear to me that i thought we completely similar... did disprove this based no, on you something just, that you was just said loudly earlier. said things at me <laughs> <laughs> i was definitely louder that's than how, you that's how you disprove things in 2023 you just we'll shout back. i think and... i think it was clear no was no 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 i was talking louder. louder no i'm no, talking I was i was louder <laughs> I think we actually agree on this point, Cameron. <laughs> yeah. Wait. So, okay. What are you saying, Dan? That the the ring has the same allure? I know. I no. I'm not. I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> saying there's similarities between the ring uh, and the similarities a, to with such a obsession take. with the silver. You're just not based enough. Oh, this <laughs> maybe I'm. You're the mainstream, and I'm the like out there guy so oh my gosh no you're yeah. like the guy who who sees a lord of the rings trailer and thinks he knows what what a silmaril is <laughs> what <laughs> what is that like you're just like a guy who sees a trailer and thinks he knows something about the story you're just a guy okay? yeah I'm, i am just a guy it's i'm weird. i have greg on my side and greg is not just a guy that's true well they they can talk about it in the in our discord chat but mm. um the 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 connections are there between the silmarils and the rings and i stand by it and i stand by mithros and his uh his his uh seemingly valiant more valiant approach to the ring i mean the silmaril okay i'm gonna change change gears here have you guys oh. ever heard someone who has worked as a spy or an intelligence um describe i can't what tell that's you like? that can't say that's <laughs> that's okay 
um, it's it sounds like really sexy, right? This kind of job, like you're a spy and you deal stuff. But people who actually work that, if you hear them talk about it, it sounds just like the most terrible life you could live because you're always worried that somebody's on to you and that somebody is trying to kill you. And, you know, especially if you're like really deep in it as a double agent or something, you're just constantly worried that you'll be found out and murdered and like killed immediately, you know, mm. or somebody knows something. And, um, I just think that's so interesting in regards to how Morgoth operates. He really relies, it says in this one, he relies on faithless men to do his bidding. And it's yeah. like, they're not trustworthy. He knows they're not trustworthy because they're, sure. they're faithless, but he relies so much on them. And I think that's part of his downfall. Hmm. He must just have, he must constantly, he doesn't have like the security of, you know, trustworthy allies. He's relying on the despicable people to do do things for him. Except for Sauron, I think he can trust that guy. I mean, they're probably pretty buddy buddy. You think so? Too. I think so. I hope we get to read more about their actual interactions. Is there is it like is there a hatred there? Well, because Sauron earlier it, it said MDS... Sauron was not as evil as Morgoth in only that he served another. Yeah. So wow. he he was. <laughs> do you think Sauron is a loyal friend? I don't think they're friends. <laughs> but they're buddy buddy. Yeah, but they're buddy buddy. And people yeah. know what I mean when I say that. Like okay. if they were if they were like hanging out in an office together and Morgoth stubbed his toe, what would how would Sauron respond? Well, it would be like an so it is like an episode of The Office. Okay. <laughs> so you gotta have the tinkling piano kind of bring in okay. and the horns. And then but, so yeah, so go ahead. So it so it is basically <laughs> Michael and Dwight, is yeah. what we're saying. Mm. Okay. All right. Yeah. But more evil. Just Yeah, because Dwight evil. would take over the throne. Yeah. He's ready to if, roll. If Michael leaves it to him, but he will yeah. always serve Michael. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm wondering is would Michael I mean would Dwight or, or sorry, Sauron throttle Morgoth in the night if he had the chance? Could he overpower him? I don't think he could. I don't think he's as powerful as Morgoth. Morgoth is I a didn't Vala. stop Morgoth trying to overpower Luvatar. Yeah, it did. I mean, the way Sauron fights, like earlier, seems more terrifying than the way Morgoth fights. Like, Morgoth seems more mm. lumbering and, like, just a heavy man. I mean, who falls when he threw people. his hammer around, Grand. Yeah, but lightning, that wasn't like lightning. transforming into a bat and like biting your neck, <laughs> like <laughs> flapping in your face. Just a terror. Uh, Dan, good job reading that that part when yeah. Fingon yells out the the words. That's a great part, I think, where and that's the beauty of like the heroes of this story. Torgon shows up unsummoned and unlooked for with an army of 10,000 strong, you know, those yeah. are those kinds of moments that Fingon's in despair. He's starting to see, okay, this might not be a winnable fight. And then Turgon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the music starts playing yeah. and Turgon. Oh, I yeah. just remembered something that uh, I liked from last reading that we didn't talk about. <laughs> Oh, Go talk ahead. about it now. Go ahead. When uh, Huan fights Kakadoth, his uh, the baying of Huan was heard. In the baying of Huan was heard the voice of the horns of Orome, just the power of like his his like howling and baying. Oh, oh yeah, that was so cool. But That's what's happening. Also, In the echoes. Go ahead. I was just gonna say. Also, it's Huan was kind of responsible for like a boo boo there. You know, like he went, oh, he off. went away. He was, he was a patient. He was like, I gotta go. Mm. I want to go kill this other wolf because I'm a wolf and he's a wolf. And the that yeah. chapter should be called the Boo Boo of Juan. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, it's not too late <laughs> when, when you when you title the episode that people will be like, "Why is it called this?" <laughs> and then, and the then they won't know until this Boo -Boo episode. Yeah, they just won't get any explanation that episode. Yeah, they'll, they'll have to wait to the end of this episode. 
But um, yeah, that was an important point because he he goes off to try and do it, and then that's when um the wolf. That's when Karkaroth comes. Yeah, yeah. Karkaroth is like, all right, I got to use this as an opportunity. Yeah, and he did. <clears throat> Juan played the price. It cost him his life. It cost it cost a lot of lives actually. So even though Juan was, I think he was a really cool character, even though he's a wolf. He he's was a wolf really, he, yeah, he had he had development of character and mm -hmm. um and was loyal and and valiant. And but then ultimately his his last act was killing uh, muddied. They killing the spawn of Morgoth's werewolf. Right, but muddied by the fact that mm. it was an imprudent. Impatient Fine. Condition. Yeah, he wasn't the best ever. Uh, yeah, yeah, but that's that's saying too much, I think. I mean, he just he went prematurely to find Kakaroth, and then he ended up fighting him anyways. Yeah, I see. How many times have I done that? Yeah, you know, just go in, go in like guns blazing. And you then, see a wolf. Yeah, a giant wolf. Okay. Well, I was talking meta. Oh, metaphorically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A no, giant but... metaphorical wolf. Yes. Returning to this, you know, when Turgon's horns start bla blaring, you hear the the bane of Juan in the distance echoing through the hills. Mm. Yeah. So he's he's baying. What what are we talking about right now? What is a bay? Bay, bay, yeah, bay, bay. Yeah, I don't think it's that. <laughs> I think it's Usher. <laughs> I, I i what is it is it like a yeah whining? i don't know like a dog is. whine is that what baying is dan i'm joining your club i don't know what baying is i'm okay. sorry greg what's baying? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it here let's <laughs> ask google is it like a dog noise right what is the sound of baying Again, yeah. What's the difference between howling and baying? Howls are sounds used by canines to assemble companions um, and pack members together. Baying is a specific sound used by scent hounds to communicate to humans and other dogs to help coordinate a hunt. So is Whoa. it baying like a... Oh, here, here, like here. Listen, of... listen, listen. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, no, oh, right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's, like it's like he's trying, trying to, to say see. things, but he's not very good at it. He's not very good at the English. Yes. Okay. So it's alerting humans to. I mean, that's what Juan was doing. I mean, I don't know why he didn't just use English because he can speak, right? So imagine um, Juan was doing that. He was like, like you know, his body was doing that, and then yeah. it was just like the sound of horns coming out of his mouth. Ah, oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> i think we've reached our limit no, no, no. no i i can picture the sound design like if you imagine hundreds of horns yeah. like in yeah. the distance echoing like yeah. you can picture like inception great... like the inception yeah. horns i was thinking more of the dune like a bagpipe noise <laughs> that one no the back the actual bagpipes yeah, that's the, awesome the marching into track. war. It was so good. Anyway, we're, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> we're done. If you made it this far, you're. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait, thank you so much for making it this far, seriously. And if you liked what you heard, please go ahead and rate us three Silmarils out of three. Follow us everywhere at Before the Fellowship and join the Discord discussion. Um, we have episode discussions up, so you can correct us on there and help us understand the story better because we're learning. Or you can ask questions, and we're avid researchers, and we like looking into things. And send us any comments or questions to beforethefellowship at gmail.com. And one last thing, if you did, if you did listen this far, um, go ahead and let us know in Discord, and there might be a special gift for you from greg maybe possibly join us next week as we read the greatest story you've never heard the silmarillion by J.R.R. tolkien before the fellowship is the greatest Was. story you are currently hearing
I'm Dan. Well, the thing is, it's kind of a it's a play on words. Before yeah, yeah, the yeah. fellowship is the name of the our fellowship show. comes after Dan. The Lord of the Rings. Before the fellowship was another story. Because <sighs> if you I'm say great. before the fellowship is the great greatest story, it's the great. Then are sense. we talking about the fellowship or uh, something called before the fellowship? I'm Cameron. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's redo. <laughs>